Listen, the last time I was in Houston, uh, I was covering Harvey, and I was standing in this inundating rain. I was out in these military vehicles in your neighborhoods looking at the flood damage firsthand. I know that that sort of sparked a big turnaround. Can you describe how that was a turning point, Mayor, and where Houston has gone since then? Look, that was a huge turning, turning point. Hurricane, Hurricane Harvey uh, dropped 52 inches of rain on the city. Um, immediately after that, we put forth our, what we call our Resilient Houston's Plan. Uh, quite frankly, underwritten by Shell, we put forth our Climate Action Plan on Earth Day of 2020 with four major pillars, uh, focusing on energy transition. You know, we're the energy capital of the world. But now energy transition, electrifying our public and private fleet, building optimization, and the fourth was material management. So there were some major initiatives we put in place. We're building higher above the flood floodplain now. That's a requirement. We're putting in a lot more detention. Uh, we are promoting green stormwater infrastructure, weatherizing homes, planting 4.6 million trees in this decade alone, uh, along with a number of other things. So we are building forward, not necessarily building back. Uh, you have uh, a lot of companies here. You have a lot of companies that do business internationally. You have Rice University, yes. I know. Do, are you getting buy-in from the business community about your action plan? Uh, there's no question we're getting buy-in. In fact, our climate action plan and our resilient Houston plan were put forth in collaboration with the business community. Uh, for example, I would tell you that there's a lot of focus now on carbon capture, utilization, and storage, uh, battery uh, utilization. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about uh, clean hydrogen. And we are utilizing working with our energy sector to take 240 contaminated acres in one of our underserved communities. And as of next year, in July or August, it will become the largest urban solar farm in the United States. And we're working very closely with our academic institutions like Rice. Uh, that has worked very closely with us, especially when it comes to material management, when it comes to our building our, 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 their carbon hub. They have their carbon hub management program. And so they're working very closely with the city of Houston, with our business community, uh, to put us in a better position as we, as we go forward. Uh, Reginald, I want to mention that in addition to being the president of Rice University, you also teach civil and environmental engineering. So you have ideas and thoughts about how to accomplish in a very real, concrete way some of the goals that the mayor is laying out. I'm just wondering for you and, and for the university, how did Harvey change the way that you see the city where you are and your partnership with the city? Yeah, it certainly changed uh, our focus in terms of the things that we do, both on the research and education side. I arrived to Houston just a few weeks before Harvey hit, and it, so it really hit home the importance of really hitting the research and the education on climate. So if you look at our curriculum, something between 10 and 20 percent of our classes, either directly or indirectly, support the energy transition, sustainability, and climate. We have a number of research projects. The mayor just mentioned a carbon hub. There are a number of projects taking place at Rice that are focused on a, a cleaner future and energy transition and supporting that effort. And yet, according to the information that I've been given, Houston still accounts for 10 percent of the U.S. emissions. Uh, of course, you've got a lot of oil and gas companies that operate in and around Houston. Are there very real ways that that can change? I mean, can you, can you do industry successfully and not contribute to the detriment of the environment? Well, I would tell you that we, yes, we have one of some of the largest greenhouse gas emitters right here in the city of Houston. And that's why it's so very important to work uh, in collaboration uh, with them. I would tell you we put forth what we call Evolve Houston. Uh, that's working with Shell, Centerpoint, uh, NRG, and uh, one of our universities. And that's to electrify our public private sector, what we call 50 by 30, 50 percent purchase of electric vehicles by 2030. Uh, we're working very closely with, uh, with our companies when it comes to carbon capture utilization and storage, as well as with clean hydrogen. And I will tell you on the material management, recycling, commercial recycling of plastic, 
We're working very closely, for example, with ExxonMobil, with Cyclip, F FCC, and other companies in order to move that forward. So there is no question we can do this without working in collaboration uh, with these companies. And to the extent we can have a significant impact locally, it will have global ramifications as well. And let me just add that one of the projects the mayor mentioned, the Carbon Hub, uh, is supported primarily by industry. Uh, Shell came in at 10 million and other companies have come in. They're sponsoring over 100 researchers uh, from 20 different institutions all over the world to really solve this problem. So they are definitely uh, part of the solution and working hand in hand with the city and with the universities here in Houston. The population is exploding. Uh, there was some question when I was covering Harvey about whether all these additional people coming in just creates more hardship in the face of the climate risk that that we're all facing. But but it's been illustrated there in Houston. Uh, I, I and I've just I've just been to a conference in San Diego uh, to talk about housing and the importance of housing in terms of uh, wealth creation in the United States. I mean, owning a home is how Americans start building wealth. Can you talk a little bit about, Mayor, how the, the lack of zoning has influenced the housing supply that you have and whether there needs to be a sort of a shift in the way that we're approaching the demand and supply issue, that pin pinch point? Yeah, this is a city that doesn't have doesn't have zoning, uh, but and there has been what we call a lot of urban sprawl in the city of Houston. But uh, but now we're kind of changing our focus. Instead of building out, we're looking at creating density and we're building up. There's a lot of emphasis now on creating what we call pedestrian, uh, walkable cities, living cities. So that's changing the way that we are doing things. As but I mentioned can I just, earlier, can I just ask uh, you we're though, building, Mayor, like, how yes, do you how yes. do you encourage developers to build up and not out if there's no zoning for that? Well, I think there's what well, we call there are creative policies that enable that to happen. Look, Harvey was a game changer for all of us in 2017. And so it's, it's in all of our best interests uh, to change the way we have uh, developed the city, the way we have built in this city. There's a lot of focus now on uh, public transit and our public transit policies. Uh, we also focus on transit-oriented development, which is also helping to create that density and causing people to build up. People want to be able to get to the places where they work. They want to be able to get to the medical center. They want to be able to be close to downtown and our urban uh, business districts. So transit, public transit, uh, has a lot to do uh, has a lot to do with that. Uh, and, for, and now, for example, we're looking at building 3,000 single-family homes by the end of 2023, and we're being very intentional as to where we are building these homes, in addition to where we are building these multi-family family units. So the city has a lot to, to play into that and the policies that we're implementing, even in the absence of zoning, we're able to change the design and the way we are developing in the city. Uh, one of the things that I have been struggling with myself is we also know not only do people want to be able to get to work, get to the hospital and things like that, but the pandemic has shown us how valuable flexibility is in where we work. And if, you, if you're living in a sprawling metropolis like Houston and anybody who's, who's been there pre-pandemic knows the traffic situation and how it feels to just sit behind the wheel of a car for a long time. It's no wonder you want mass transit to work. I'm wondering whether that has influenced at all your expectation or desire to get people back in the offices. I mean, in New York City, where I live, the mayor has been very clear. City workers are back on the job. And, he, and, and <laughs> my sense is that there's some arm twisting to get these big companies to pull their people back into the office so that it spurs commerce, you know, the, that the small businesses can get some business. But, th but that being said, it's not good for the environment to have people in their cars for hours on end every day, right? How do you balance those two things? Well, that's true. And the workers, the city workers are back. They've been back uh, in their offices in the city of Houston. Uh, we are encouraging the companies and the businesses, for example, in the, in the downtown areas and our business districts. Uh, to bring work, bring their workers back. We're doing that. 
But we're also just trying to do some other things that will attract them back. Uh, many of our sporting events, for example, are right close to these business districts or to the downtown areas. And people want to be where the action is. We're investing, for example, in our local neighborhood parks, uh, green spaces, uh, that's where, that where people want to be. So we are doing that uh, in, a, in a huge, in a big, big way. Uh, enhancing the quality of life, for example, yeah. uh, that will attract people to these to these spaces. Reginald, what about for you, for Rice University? I mean, are you trying to balance the impact on climate and the impact on culture by having people back on the campus? Y yes, we are. And obviously, we're in a different space now than we were two years ago when COVID first took place. But our, our goal is always to uh, be able to achieve our mission, our educational research mission, while balancing that with the health of the members of our community. And I think we did that well. And now we're in a different place where, with employees, with staff in particular, some staff are required to be there in person because they're student-facing or their jobs warrant that. And there are some that have a little bit more flexibility in their roles. And we give them that flexibility, knowing that we want them on campus at least some of the time. And so it's, it's still evolving. Uh, but we, we, I think we're in a much better place now than we were a couple years ago when the pandemic first hit. Uh, l let me ask you, the mayor was talking a little bit about electric vehicles. Are you changing the infrastructure on campus, uh, Reginald, to accommodate the changes that the mayor wants? Like, uh, is it becoming an investment on the part of Rice University as well to try and push this forward? It, ab it absolutely is. It absolutely is. So we announced uh, earlier this year in January that our goal is to be uh, carbon neutral by 2030, uh, which is an ambitious goal eight years from now. And that includes a variety of things, in including our physical infrastructure on campus. And electric vehicles will certainly be part of that as we roll out our plans to do that. And can you talk a little bit about, now I'm going to ask the professor in you, uh, are there specific <laughs> new technologies that Rice is developing? I, I know that you've got a pipeline and you're trying to send your graduates right directly into Houston and keep them local. Are there new technologies that they're working on that you think will be beneficial to Houston and, and then can be modeled elsewhere? Absolutely. And there are a lot. I'll just mention one. There's a company called Syzygy, which was uh, established around 10 years ago and out of research from a lab at Rice, which uh, looks at developing these chemicals, uh, ammonia, hydrogen, methanol, which are any, very energy intensive, but they do it using light, which is completely transformational. They've already raised over $40 million uh, for, their, for their work, uh, and they have a huge plant here in Houston. They're expanding throughout the country, and I think this will be a transformational technology, technology not just for Houston, but for the rest of the world. Mayor, I, I, I'm looking here at your, your goals, the ambitious goals that have been laid out for a resilient Houston two years, how you're doing. You know, yes. a lot, you've put a lot of programs in place here. Just wondering, what grade would you give you, would you give yourself on progress? And what do you think that other cities in the United States could learn from the way Houston has responded to Harvey and the way it's approaching a new and different era in climate? Well, in terms of grade, uh, you know, I've, um, I've always been an overachiever, so I'm going to give the city an A. <laughs> uh, look, <laughs> let, me, let me put it this way. Uh, Greentown Labs moved, expanded from the Boston area to Houston. Uh, one, and one of their uh, plans was to create 50 2.0 energy clean tech companies by 2025. As of today, uh, they have created uh, more than 64 clean 2.0 uh, clean tech, climate tech companies. Uh, that is, the Greentown Labs is right across the street from one of our innovation, innovation districts, the ION, which Rice University invested well over $100 million in. Mm -hmm. So they are well ahead of schedule. They have also started their uh, decarbonization uh, hydrogen hub program, and that's now off and running. So I'm very pleased with the progress that's, that's taking place there. In terms of the other initiatives that we put in place, those things are starting to work. And, and so the companies are working in collaboration with the city and with some of our civic organizations. I think what we have learned is that, uh, you know, Houston is the energy capital of the world. Who would have thought that we would have put in place a resilient Houston plan, underwritten by Shell? 
And who would have thought that our climate action plan that we, would, that we announced would be underwritten by our major utility, Centerpoint? And then on Earth Day, this past Earth Day, we announced our building decarbonization plan, in which every year the goal is to reduce energy consumption and water usage by 5 percent every single year. So those are plans that we put in place in the energy capital of the world. And so to the extent it can be achieved and done right here in the city of Houston, quite frankly, it can be done anywhere. We face seven federally declared storms in the last seven years. Mm. And so now it's critically important that this city leads an energy transition, that we electrify our public and private fleet, that we plant the necessary trees, we do the heat mapping, all of those things that will be essential to put us in the best place going forward.